All right, section 116 through 120. Um, Adam on Diamond is located here. Very interesting. Um, this comes from the like a notebook of Joseph Smith. Section 116 was not in the original Doctrine and Covenants. It's not added till 1876 by Orson Pratt. Um, so this is. It used to be called Spring Hill. Joseph went up to. Uh, this is up in Davies County, up at the northern uh, county that was appointed for the Mormons. Lyman White had a little ferry up there uh, called White's Ferry. Joseph went to visit him and uh, other saints. They were going to make some stakes in that area. And as he's in Adam on Diamond, he sees a tower. He calls it, uh, what tower does he call it? He says it was a Nephite altar. He, he started calling this place Tower Hill. Uh, and then uh, we just have this. Uh, then this came to Joseph. Uh, Spring Hill is named by the Lord Adam on thy almond. So this is not the revelation, but a copy of it's like the aftermath. Because, said he, it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people, where the Ancient of Days shall sit as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. End of section. No one even been there? Adam on thy almond. Spring Hill. Yeah. What's there in it? Grass. Grass. A sign. Aerial, yeah. Aerial view. This is the valley of Adam on down here. There's rattlesnakes there. Yeah. Uh, church missionaries get called there. Senior couples, usually with farming backgrounds, so they can cultivate the land. They grow crops out there in the valley of Adam on down. Uh, there's a skinnier version of me in that Monday. <laughs> uh, he linked it to a prophecy in Daniel. Did you catch that? Uh, so this gives us, this is one, back when we did section 27, uh, we learned about who will be in attendance and the qualifications to attend this meeting. This gives us a location. This is the vision. This is a prophecy. Uh, this is the type and shadow of the future meeting, 107. In 107, uh, should we just look at that real quick? Go back to 107. So this is when Joseph Smith Jr. was setting his father, Joseph Smith Sr., apart as patriarch, and he had this vision as he's got his hands on his dad's head. Then he later adds this to section 107. What he learned during that priesthood blessing was that three years previous to the death of Adam, Adam called Seth and Enos and Canaan Mahalaleel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, all these high priests, together with all his righteous posterity, to Adam on thy almond, and there he bestowed his last blessing. And the Lord appeared to them, and they rose up and blessed Michael, and called him Michael the Prince, the Archangel. And the Lord administered comfort to Adam, and said that uh, he had set Adam as, at the head, and that a multitude of nations would come of him, and he would be a prince over his posterity forever. So that becomes a type and a shadow in the, sense, in the sense that that's going to happen again. Adam will be there in that valley together with all of his righteous posterity. This time it's big, a lot more than was there in the original meeting. And then the Lord will come to them and will partake of the fruit of the vine, the promises here, with them. Um, so some future day this artist has <coughs> put this together. Some future day this is going to happen where the Savior comes. Daniel 7, if you read Daniel 7, uh, every Christian commentary you read in the world will say that the Ancient of Days is God the Father. Ancient of Days will come and sit, and then Jesus uh, will then come after the Father is there. Uh, only Mormons believe, because of section 116, that the Ancient of Days means Adam, the most ancient man. Uh, most, you know... Unless you have section 116, you wouldn't pick up that, that little detail. Um, but that is uh, Adam, the Ancient of Days, right there. So that's an important commentary on that prophecy. Um, in Daniel it says that 10,000 times 10,000 or something people will be there. His posterity will be there. Uh, that This is the time when Jesus, uh, after Adam arrives, then Jesus comes. And this is when Jesus will give to the saints... Uh, the the earth so they can rule and reign with him on the earth forever and ever and uh, you can look in Daniel sometime and read that prophecy it's really good 
So we start to think, wait, so if Adam on the island was there, then, wait a second. Right? This is where we start to learn like ancient biblical geography. Joseph starts to talk about this kind of thing. I don't know if you caught, I didn't point it out, but go back to section 115. Did you notice in verse 7, what did the Lord call far west, which is south of Adam on the island? He calls it a consecrated land, and then he calls it what? Most holy. Yeah, he says, this ground that you're standing on is holy. And doesn't really comment on it. Why is it holy? Uh, well, here's, here's what... Uh, so the best I could find is this Reed Peck manuscript that gives the... Uh, that gives a second-hand account of what the first presidency said about this area. They say, in 1838, the first presidency directed their attention to Davies County, lying immediately north of Caldwell, which they laid out a city of the third state of Zion and named it Adam on Dial, informing their followers that it was the place to which Adam fled. Did you fled. accidentally summon me? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I did accidentally. Uh, so that's the place where Adam fled when driven from the Garden of Eden in Jackson County. And that far west was the spot where Cain killed Abel. So that's the source that we have that's describing why far west is a holy spot. It's the place where Abel, Abel's martyred blood was. So you can like lay it out like this. Garden of Eden, where Cain kills Abel and Adam on the island. Um, the place where Adam flees to. Uh, that's not in our... Preach my gospel. It's not the first discussion or the second discussion. Uh, in fact, if you look on a Mormon, a Mormon newsroom or what's it called, the Mormon, it's like this frequently asked questions page. Do Mormons believe that the uh, uh, Garden of Eden was in Jackson County, Missouri? And the answer is? Not necessarily. Yeah, you should Google it. I mean, look at it on uh, the Estador. I believe it says something like some early church leaders made statements to that effect. But that is totally peripheral to the central message of proclaiming the gospel to the world. So we're kind of going through a period of trying to not be weird, right? not look weird. Anything that kind of sounds weird, we want to kind of like not talk about as much. Right? This is not our, our missionary message to the world. This is not our PR campaign. Uh, so uh, did leaders of the church say stuff like that? Yeah, we don't get any first-hand accounts of Joseph saying it. Uh, but we get lots of second-hand accounts from people that we can trust, like Wilfred Woodruff and Brigham Young and Huber C. Kimball. Uh, also go to section 117. Section 117. Um, as far as geography, we're just going into this cold turkey without uh, any background, huh? Um, it's not just, so if you, if you scrutinize verse section 116, you'll say, well, this doesn't say that Adam dwelt there. It just says that that's where he's going to come. So he could have dwelt anywhere. This is not identifying that as the ancient place. True. But go over to 117, verse 8. Is there not room enough on the mountains of Adam on Diamond, on the plains of Olaha Shainha, or the land where Adam dwelt? There you go. There's the historical uh, connection. So, uh, does verse 8 say that Spring Hill is the place where Adam dwelt? Yeah, that's not that common. You can see why we think why that's a belief that's not challenged much by members of the church. So, there you go. Was the city of Enoch in the Gulf of Mexico? Is that why there's the Gulf there? Maybe. There's second-hand accounts about that, too. But that's what the early church leaders So, Was the flood of Noah over there? And when the flood happens... Then he's gone for a year, and then the waters recede, and then he ends up over in the Middle East, and Mount Ararat, and then they kind of forget about this land. That's one theory. So I don't know how long you want to dwell on that through students, but this this is where this, this stuff comes from, is right here. Uh, this geographical stuff that uh, makes people outside the church kind of look at us like we're weird. <laughs> it might turn out that it's true. In fact, it kind of seems like it is. Right? Again, there's not an A to A connection, it's like A to A point one. It's like almost, it's like almost solid right here in the text, right? Almost in our scriptures. It's definitely going to be the future place of the meeting of Gang of Seven. Was it the past place? It sounds like it from 117 verse, verse 8. So, there you go. Let's go to 117. Any thoughts? Any other, anything else you want to say about 116? Okay. 
Wait, I have a question. Why not? I'll throw one. Why did Joseph say there's a Nephite tower there? And there's another tower that he says was the tower that Adam built when he offered sacrifice to the Lord after he was cast out of the Garden of Eden. Saints had gone there for years and years, and I checked it out. And uh, James E. Talmadge went there, and he talks about going there and looking at the rocks and examining them as an archaeologist slash apostle, wondering if there was death before the fall. So he says, I examined the altar that was purportedly the one that Joseph said was the altar that Adam used. And he said, I found fossils in the rocks that, jo that apparently Adam used to build the altar upon which he offered sacrifice. So if you try to tell me there was no death before the fall, I have a hard time believing that because I found fossils in Adam's rocks. Uh, if you go there today, can you see the altar? It's totally gone. I don't know if it's Taurus just taking a little piece of the pie, a piece of the pie, but, but it, there's, there's, it's not there anywhere, anywhere to be seen now. But, uh, see. but so Nephite altar is also interesting. Does that mean, does that mean the Nephites actually maybe, that's proof positive that the Book of Mormon happened up in North America. There's a theory to that effect, right? People make that argument that that, that clearly shows there's a Nephite altar. Boom. Book of Mormon happened in the North. Why is that not a home run? Book more itself says that Nephite spread out, so in particularly which direction? North, north, right? Helaman three talks about the northern migration. Uh, yeah, there's uh, some pretty smart <coughs> archaeologists slash Book of Mormon uh, geniuses like Mark Wright in the church. He's written a great paper that talks about North America as Book of Mormon hinterlands. Yeah. That uh, you do find Nephite relics up here because of that northern migration. So both, you could have both the Central uh, America theory and North America have Nephite going on without having to abandon the Central America theory. So that doesn't necessarily uh, blast the Central America theory. These debates go on and on and on. I asked Elder Scott once, I said, where do you think the Book of Mormon happened? And he said, I'm still interested in trying to understand what's in the book. And so as soon as I feel like I've got that down, then I'll start wondering about where it happened. It's like, okay, good point. <laughs> Message received. <laughs> so, that's good. Um, all right, section 117. Section 117. Anyway, I just wanted to catch up to date on the old uh, battle of the geography, right? <laughs> uh, you'll, yeah, if you're a teacher in this system for any length of time it's going to come up, right? Students are going to wonder and just be aware of what happens with that. Okay, so section 117 comes uh, to William Marks, Newell K. Whitney, and a guy named Oliver Granger. Uh, let's talk about these two first. William Marks, he was <coughs> in charge of uh, a shop in Kirtland, and you know Newell K. Whitney had the store in Kirtland. Uh, you know Kirtland Camp has happened, and the Saints have all come to Far West who are true and faithful. Except for William Marks hasn't come yet. And Noel K. Whitney haven't showed up yet. They're still doing business back in Kirtland. And kind of dragging their feet to join the saints in far west. And Joseph's nervous about them. Uh, will, they, will they also be overcome by the enemy? Will they also uh, be taken in by filthy lucre and the apostate spirit that's in Kirtland? And so as he inquires about them, this is the result. So this is to William and Newell. And later on, this man named Oliver Granger uh, was a messenger of the First Presidency, someone to help uh, them uh, raise money and stuff. We'll talk more about him in just a second. But they're not, he's not in trouble. But maybe William is, and maybe Newell is, so Joseph inquires about them. So Joseph Fielding Smith says, speaking about these two men, it's quite evident that these two brethren had fallen under the spell of speculation and temptation so rife in Kirtland in 1837, and which was the downfall of so many of the leading brethren of the church. So it seems quite evident that they were kind of in that. So let's look at what the Lord has to say to these men. Uh, first, first commandment, verse 1. The Lord wants both William and Newell to settle up their business and get uh, and leave Kirtland for far west before it snows. Verse 2, another commandment. Let them awake. Wake up. 
Snap out of it. You're under the spell. Wake up. Rise up. Come forth. Don't tarry. I, the Lord, command it. Verse 3, if they tarry, it shall not be well with them. You guys ever been in a situation where you knew that if you tarried much longer, it would not be well with you spiritually? You've been there? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, the, that's exactly the setting that they're in. Right? If you tarry much longer, you're gonna, it's not going to be good. Uh, verse 4, let them repent of all their covetous desires before me, say the Lord. For what is property unto me? You can tell what's in their heart, right? What's property of me? Let the properties of Kirtland be turned out for debts, and saith the Lord. Let them go, saith the Lord. And whatsoever remaineth, let it remain in your hands, saith the Lord. For have I not the fowls of heaven, and the fish of the sea, and the beasts of the mountains? Have I not made the earth? Do I not hold the destinies of all the armies of the nations of the earth? Therefore will I not make solitary places to bud and to blossom and to bring forth an abundance, saith the Lord. Well, is there not room on Adam on thy almond? On the plains of Olaha Shainha, the land where Adam dwelt, that you should covet that which is but the drop, and neglect the more weighty matters. Therefore, come up hither to the land of my people, even Zion. Whoa, what the Lord just called? His Far people. west? Zion. Interesting. So that's not just Jackson County, Missouri. Huh? Um, thoughts so far? You know, Stephen Arbor yesterday was talking about how uh, one of the great ways to read the Doctrine of Covenants, a really important way to make sure you get it all, is to not think of these people as either, what, fully saints or fully, like, just evil, right? But that they're a lot like us, a lot like you and me and our students who are going to struggle with things, they're going to they're gonna wrestle with, in this case, covetousness. Um, in this case, they want to set their families up for, you know, a good future. The Lord says, give it all up. Come on, let go. Let go of that. Let it go. And, and, and come join with the saints. Um, so there they are. Good man. Struggling. He's going to later go on to become the state president in Nauvoo. No K. Whitney uh, will also die faithful. They do, they do heed this, this section, this revelation. Uh, I like the phrase in uh, verse 8. Uh, why covet the drop and neglect the more weighty matters? Why, why covet uh, a single little drop? The, dan the danger of covetousness is not that we desire too much, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's that we desire too little. I like to share that with my students here. Right, that uh, you sell yourself short, uh, you settle for far less than the Lord desires to give you when you give Him up for other stuff. Um, it's true of money, it's true of power, it's true of the procreative power. I'd like to talk about that for a minute and just say, you know, when people selfishly try to indulge in any of those things and do those things instead of the way the Lord has, has asked us to go about that, you're actually giving up way more than what God desires to give you. Covetousness is that you just desire too little. President Kimball puts it like this, he says, one man I know, uh, was called to a position of service in the church, but he felt that he couldn't accept it because his investments required more attention and more of his time than he could spare for the Lord's work. He left the service of the Lord in search of mammon. He's a millionaire today. He got it. But I recently learned an interesting fact. <laughs> this is fun. If a man owns a million dollars worth of gold at today's prices, he possesses approximately one twenty-seven billionth of all the gold that is present in the earth's thin crust alone. This is an amount so small in proportion as to be inconceivable to the mind of man. Uh, to set aside God's great promises in favor of a chest of gold and a sense of carnal security is a mistake in perspective of colossal proportions. To think that he has settled for so little is a saddening and pitiful prospect indeed. The souls of men are far more precious than this. Uh, the Lord wants to give us all that he Perhaps, right? Not just inherit the earth, just, but all the Father has. Equal in power, might, dominion, authority, right? So, and the perspective problem here is great. Like, if you stay, you might actually succeed in business, and it will not be well with you, because that could make you give up way, way more, right? So, great perspective moment here to kind of wrestle with as mortals. I think we all, we all do that, don't we? That's cool. Uh, verse 10, let my servant 
William Marks, be faithful over a few things, and he shall be a ruler over many. Let him preside in the midst of my people in the city of Far West, and let him be blessed with the blessings of my people. He will preside there, but like I said, as they move and get kicked out of Missouri, he will then preside at Nauvoo as the state president. Let my servant Newell K. Whitney be ashamed of the Nicolaitan Band. Nicolaitan Band was a, a music group during that time that was had some really bad music. I'm just kidding. That's <laughs> no, the, the Nicolaitan Band, that's a, that's a reference to a New Testament group, right? The Nicolaitan Band. Uh, Stephen Harper reminds us what that is. Uh, Nicolaitans were followers of Nicholas of Antioch, an early Christian called and ordained to look after the business of ministering to widows. Nicholas apostatized, however, and led a faction that justified their covetous and lustful impulses. The illusion is the Lord's potent way of conveying to Newell how evil the Lord finds the Kirtland apostates and how near Newell is himself to committing their sins. He calls the Kirtland apostates the Nicolaitan band. Mm -hmm. little, little uh, New Testament dig there on the Kirtland apostates. But rather, uh, let him be ashamed of all their secret abominations and of all his littleness of soul before me. A great statement. Repent of your littleness of soul. And come up to the land of Adam and I am and be a bishop to my people here, saith the Lord. Not in the name, but in deed, saith the Lord. Uh, and then he turns his attention to Oliver Granger. So Oliver Granger. What do you know about Oliver Granger? Yeah, that's, that's, that's typical. Um, right? We don't often talk about Oliver Granger hardly at all. But verse 12 says that we should. I remember President Packer gave a talk about him. Here's his, here's his gravestone. Uh, this is right next to the temple. It says, Oliver Grange. And then they ran out of space. So then there's a tiny little R etched in right there. <laughs> so, oops, they didn't, they didn't have the justify function. Uh, make it cent center that thing. Uh, but verse 12 says that this Oliver Granger man, uh, his name will be had in sacred remembrance from generation to generation forever and ever, saith the Lord. So do you think you should talk about it in your seminary class? Sounds like it, yeah. Uh, the Lord wants his name had in sacred uh, remembrance. Um, on the back of his grave, it looks like that. It's just a bunch of like pock marks. There's like zero information. So, like, people have been like shooting it with like 22s or something. I don't know. Uh, or it's just, you know, erosion. Uh, I thought, you know, we really don't talk about him much. Uh, he's, he's kind of despised by some uh, in that early day of verse 15. Therefore let no man despise my servant Oliver Granger. Let the blessings of my people be on him forever and ever. Uh, Oliver Granger. I remember taking this picture. I was like, man, nobody seems to know about him. He just, you know, I took that picture. As a garbage truck was driving by. See, that's just that's just typical. See, of how uh, how he you know he's forgotten. He, he his 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 tombstone is eroded. The little R. Uh, I was like, oh, okay, but I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so, uh, President Packer, what does President Packer want us to do with him? What's the message of his life for us? So you should look up a talk from President. If you just type in LDS.org Oliver Granger, uh, you'll find the talk by President Packer, and he gives some great counsel and thoughts about Oliver Granger and what we should, uh, how we should remember him. But he, what he does, basically the aftermath of this, is spot, as, uh, mentioned in verse 13. Let him contend earnestly for the redemption of the first presidency of my church, saith the Lord, and when he falls, he shall rise again. For his sacrifice shall be more sacred unto me than his increase, saith the Lord. And that's what President Packer spends most of the talk on. His sacrifice will be more sacred to me than his increase. His job is to go and recoup money to help the First Presidency with their debts. He doesn't do a very good job. He doesn't recoup a ton of their debts, as I understand. Uh, but that's okay. The Lord says, I just wanted him engaged in my cause. I'm grateful for him. He is wonderful. Final thought there in verse 16. Again, verily I say unto you, let all my servants in the land of Kirtland remember the Lord their God and my house also to keep and preserve it holy and to overthrow the money changers in mine own due time. Say it the Lord, even so, amen. End of section 117. So, mostly a rebuke with some Oliver Granger stuff there. Thoughts, comments on that? Okay. Are you thinking of how you can take these things and make them into good class discussions? Hopefully, take, take this fundamentals a little higher than we're going. To
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't do this in summary class. Like, All right, that's it. I'll move on. You want to develop? Sink a little deeper on these things. Uh, section 118 is really fun. And it's sad. Fun. The aftermath of it. So, section 118, context is this. Uh, four new apostles needed to be called because of the four that have fallen. He calls them the, those who have fallen. There's the four who have fallen. William McClellan, Luke Johnson, Lyman Johnson, and John F. Boynton. Those have fallen. They have been excommunicated from the church. There needs to be uh, four new apostles called. So section 118 is that. Uh, by the way, what's the date of section uh, 118? July 8th. July 8th. What about section 17? July 8th. July 8th. Uh, so what about 119? July 8th. Okay, what about 120? July 8th. Okay, so this was a good day. July 8th was good. So he's asking questions about a lot of different things. What about William Marks and Bill K. Whitney? Boom. Okay. What about the four vacancies? Boom. Uh, then 19 and 20 is going to be about uh, tithing and consecration. So uh, here's the Lord's response. Who should they be? You know them. You love them. Verse 6. Yeah, John Taylor, Johnny Page, Wolford Woodruff, Willard Richards. Yeah, the A team, except for John Page, who apostatizes. But other than that, <laughs> super good. Super good A team here. Yeah. By the way, uh, Luke Johnson comes back to the church. Um, he doesn't. William McClellan does not. Lyman doesn't. And John doesn't. But he does. I was just at his gravesite on Saturday at the Salt Lake Cemetery. He's right there, actually really close to John Taylor's grave. And uh, when he comes back to the church, he'll go across the plains, he'll go to Utah, he'll become a bishop in Tooele. He's the only apostle to later be a bishop. <laughs> Luke. <laughs> Luke. Yeah, so, so that's, that's his story. Now, uh, in this, let's just look at a few assignments that are given here. So Thomas, this is Thomas B. Marsh, is to remain for a season in the land of Zion to publish my word. He does. He starts to publish the Elder's Journal. That's what it was called. Uh, they only print a few issues. In the first issue, I believe, after the Kirtland apostasy, there's some like really intense railing on people that apostatize. It just like, points out every single flaw that they have. It's like really bad. Um, Warren Cowdery, Oliver Cowdery's brother, I just read something in there in the Elder's Journal about him, and it's just like... Just rips on him. So uh, I don't know if that was Thomas's writing or not, but it's it wasn't very nice. Uh, Sidney Rigdon will give a sermon on the Fourth of July called the Salt Sermon, famously, and it's going to be published in the Elder's Journal. That's going to whip up the uh, people in that area, the the non Mormons, into a frenzy and want to. It's going to be a piece of the puzzle that wants that, that makes them want to expel the saints. Um, now he also gives them this. Let the residue continue to preach from that hour, if they will do this in all lowliness of heart, meekness, humility, long-suffering. I give you a promise that I will provide for your families, and an effectual door shall be opened from them, for them from henceforth. And next spring, let them depart to go over the great waters, the ocean, and there promulgate my gospel, the fullness thereof, and bear record of my name. That is the, uh, the British mission. Verse 5, let them take leave of my saints in the city of Far West. Now this is interesting. On the 26th day of April next, on the building spot of my house, saith the Lord. And then he replaces them with those four apostles. So they're supposed to leave to the British mission from the Far West Temple spot on the 26th of April next. What happens in the eight and a half month period between the 8th of July and the 26th of April, 1839? What happens in Missouri during that time? Kicks out. Yeah, they're kicked out. So, right, so here we go. Persecution breaks out. Uh, the extermination order issued by Governor Boggs uh, that next, that coming October. Many saints are killed. Joseph and other leaders are betrayed and incarcerated in Liberty Jail. Uh, no member of the church is safe in the state of Missouri. And uh, Brigham Young and the other leaders have, have led the saints from Missouri into Quincy, Illinois for safety. That's where they're at. They're in Quincy the next April. 26, 1839. And so, uncomfortably, the apostles began to talk in April about what do we do about that commandment? What do we do about the commandment that says, 
leave to England from the far west temple spot on the 26th of April next. Certainly the Lord would be fine if we left Wednesday, wouldn't he? <laughs> wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be okay? But he, he, but he mentions that, right? So I kind of wondered about this. What about that? What about that? It's really specific. On the building spot of my house. Dang it. <laughs> uh, so they hold, they hold a council like, what should we do? Brigham Young says, what do, you, what do we propose? As they look around, you know, vote for Woodruff's leg. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go. Let's go back. And they're like, whoa. And they're all like, yeah. And so they're all like, okay, we're going. <laughs> so uh, they get on their horses and they ride in under the cloud of darkness, or the cover of darkness, uh, during the night time. Here's what happens. So the day set for the departure of the apostles approaching the far away. Mob leaders are boasting. Joe Smith's prophecy is going to fail because that came from Joe Smith. Uh, there it is. Okay, I was paraphrasing. I was already in my PowerPoint here. Uh, we felt the Lord had given the command and we had faith to go forward and accomplish it. That was his business. Whether we lived or died in the accomplishment of this, so we started for Missouri. So they go there. They go across the Missouri border. They sneak in under cover of darkness. They go to the temple spot. Wilford Woodruff kneels down. After they, uh, sorry, they, they went ahead and uh, uh, I think they dedicated the temple right there. They, they, they uh, dedicated one of these temple stones uh, right there. And then Wilford Woodruff knelt on it and they ordained him an apostle right there. And then they're like, is that good? That good? And then they sang a hymn. They sang a hymn, Adam on Diamond. And then they're like, okay. Okay, let's go. <laughs> uh, and, then they, and then they book it out of there. Uh, on their way out, though, they couldn't resist. Uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. I didn't review this piece of history, so it faded from my head. But one of them goes and knocks on the door of one of the apostates. And he opens the door, and he's like, hey, Brother Turley. Yeah, and he's, and he's like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I'm just hanging out with the 12. He's like, the 12? He's like, yeah, don't you know, today's April 6th. Prophecy fulfilled. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he's like, dang it! You know, and says the guy's in the background throwing his hat down, like, oh, you know, cursing. <laughs> Find the details of that story, it's a really good one. I forgot the names of those involved. All right, section 119 and 120. Uh, fun little story there. What would you have done? <laughs> what would you have gone? Would you? What would you have dedicated the temple to? Yeah. Risked your life. To be. What's that? Risked their life. Yeah, risked their well, By the way, why did they dedicate the temple on that day? Because they weren't coming back. Yeah, I go to section, chains. remember what, section 115, verse 11 I said it was important? I forgot to make that connection. In one year from this day, Oh, yeah. Let them recommence laying the foundation of my house. And what's that day? April 26th. So to fulfill that commandment and the other commandment, they, they dedicate that uh, cornerstone. They go for Woodruff's Park. Singing Let's get out of here. That was it. That was their little more work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if those <laughs> are the two, added, it's dedicated. two prophecies they're trying to fulfill. Huh. Commandments, yeah. All right. Tithing revelations. <clears throat> how much? Who decides how it's used? Uh, you know, a little, the bigger context, right, is that the United Firm has now been dissolved. The, they had been having the Kirtland part of the firm still running, but now, obviously, you know, it's happening in Kirtland, so now that's dissolved. So now, how are we going to get money to build and prosper, you know, the cause of Zion and take care of the poor and all that stuff? What do we do? Lord, please, how much do you require for the tithe of your people? That's Joseph's question. Show unto thy servant how much thou requires of thy properties of, the, of thy people for a tithing. What do you what do you want? And how do we do? Answer. Verses one through three. I require all their surplus property to be put in the hands of the bishop of my church in Zion. That uh, would be used for the building of Far West Temple, laying the foundation of Zion, and for the priesthood, and for the debts of the presidency of my church. Verse two. Then. Tithe number two, so there's two tithes mentioned here. Tithe number two, verse four. After that, after a full consecration of all your property, then those who have thus been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually 
and this shall be a standing law unto them forever. So sometimes we just quote section 119 and we say, this is the law of tithing as we live it today. Booyah, done. Is that true? Which one do we live today? Number two. Yeah, we only live tithe number two. We don't live tithe number one. Um, uh, when you look, so, so, so I disagree a little bit with the section heading on this, okay? So, um, I'd like to talk with Steve Harper and others and Joseph Papers about this, be like, hey, how come this is still in the scriptures? You see where it says the last, second to last sentence, third to last sentence, where it says, because of the failure, see that? Uh, because of the because of failure on the part of many to abide by this covenant, look at the previous sentence, talking about the law of consecration of stewardship of property. Because of failure on the part of many to abide by that covenant, the Lord withdrew that for a time and gave instead the law of tithing to the whole church. That is violated immediately by verse one. The Lord says, "I have not revoked that." Right? That's, so that's that's not a good heading. He says, no, I still require that. That's never been revoked. I still want the surplus. It's not, I haven't, or not surplus, I want, I want, I want all your surplus property. Put it in the hands of the bishop. That's exactly what he said in section 42. And in addition to that, after you've been tithed in that way, I want one-tenth. So, anyway, I should ask Steve. Any of you guys know? Yeah, please. I was going to ask a question. Did they stop, did they stop living the law, the previous law from 42 this whole time? Were they not, were they kind of well, yeah, so Bishop Partridge is now, he'd gone to Missouri and was trying to get implement there, but then the Missouri mobs and all that happened, and they've been kicked out of there, so they haven't been doing this. And over in Kirtland, no, they haven't really been doing it. Neil K. Whitney was the man running it there, but uh, it's it, it was faltering at best ever. Neil K. Whitney is the man. Yeah. So, I I. The only way I can interpret this based on how the church history has played out up to our day and what the prophets are teaching now is that this was a one-time tithe, once for that group, and that this is the standing law, right? At least that's how it's been, that's how it's operated since section 119. So anyway, what seems to be like a super straightforward revelation, you read it carefully, like, uh, verse 1 is like troublesome, right? Because it's not exactly what we do today. So I just wanted to point out that road bump for you, lets you wrestle with that. Um, but uh, one tenth of our all of your your interest annually, right there, verse four. That's that's the standing law for us today. Um, what does interest annually mean? First presidency tells us it means income. It means income. All right. What amounts to ten percent of your individual incomes is between you and your maker. Right. So you're never going to be you're never going to be. Uh, uh, audited, right, for your your title. There you go. So that is 119. Yes, please. Oh, wait. Um, okay, so section 120, related to that, uh, section 120 uh, makes known how to uh, dispose of the, how, there should be, how do we dispense of that money and how do we use it, how do we make sure it's used correctly once we get it. So the, this, is, this section creates the council of the disposition of tithes. This decides how tithing is used. The Lord sets it up and says, here's the members of your council in Joseph's day, uh, right there, first presidency, bishop and his council and my high council. That was the Missouri presidency and high council. Uh, by their voice, or my voice unto them, they will decide how it's used today in our day. <coughs> First Presidency, Presiding Bishop, and the Quorum of the Twelve. They represent the Council of the Disposition of Tithes. If you want to just like rock your students' world, just like play like the auditing report of the General Conference. So listen to this, guys. You know, uh, and Bill, just kidding. It's actually not the best part of the conference. But he is, uh, that guy stands up and says, we have audited the dispensation, the the uh, council, the disposition of tithes, and we can tell you and affirm to you members of the church that they, they, have used these monies responsibly. Your donations have been used responsibly. Just so you know, right? so that's what that's just an annual or a, do they do it every conference or just once a year? I think it's just annual. Just annual. So, once a year, affirmation that we're, uh, we can independently verify that that does, that council is using your money well. So. That's what that's on. Uh, good. Thoughts, comments, questions about 
section 116 to 120 before we end the segment. Okay. Thank you.